All right. Welcome back, everyone. Hope everyone had a great break. And now as we rejoin, we're going to change gears in this next session, and we're going to hear from our quick hit presenters. Now, every year, more than 100 of the country's top young minds work alongside our scientists on a broad range of childhood disability research, all with the goal to create more meaningful and healthy futures for children with disabilities and their families through scientific excellence. This year, a panel of family leaders, scientists, and research staff had the very difficult task of choosing the top five quick hits for more than 20 outstanding submissions from our trainees. The presentations were ranked by the quality and impact of their research, their relevance to childhood disability community, and if the presentation would be engaging and meaningful to our audience here today. Each trainee will have three minutes to summarize their research. And if you have any questions for the presenters, you can speak to them all directly at their poster during the virtual poster presentations, which begin this morning at 11.30 a.m. Now, after each Quick Hits presentations, there will be a fun Kahoot quiz. So to play this game, we're gonna ask everybody to be interactive, either grab your mobile phone or on your Google screen uh, on your desktop, type in kahoot.it. It'll be in the uh, text box. Greg, if you can put that website into our chat box as well, you can click it from there. And we will share the pin on screen that you're gonna be entering into this text box to play the quiz uh, for today's quick hits. There's the link there, play.kahoot.it. Now keep this game handy, open on your phone or on your browser tab for the quiz portion after each of our quick hit presentations. We're gonna use the same pin to play all of the quizzes. And you can vote for your favorite quick hits presenter. So there will be winners. You keep an eye out for a message on uh, feed loop to vote after all five presentations are finished. And the winner of the best quick hits presentation will be announced during the awards ceremony later this afternoon. Now that's in addition to the quizzes we'll be doing throughout today's quick hit. So have that ready. I'm now proud to introduce to you our top five presenters. Please welcome our first presenter, Madison Jills. The title of Madison's research presentation is Research on the Sexuality of Youth with Physical Disabilities Focuses on Sexual Abuse but Misses So Much More. Greg, go ahead. Hi there, my name is Madison Giles and I'm excited to share with you the results from our systematic review that shows the research on the sexuality of youth with physical disabilities often focuses on sexual abuse, but misses so much more. And I'll just share my screen now. And here's our wonderful team on the project. The sexual agency of youth with physical disabilities is often underdeveloped. Adults often make decisions on behalf of youth and the resources that exist are not specific to disability. So as a result, many youth aren't left with the tools to really thrive as sexual beings. So we wanted to see what literature is out there on this topic. We did a systematic review of qualitative and mixed method studies, as well as gray literature. And the studies had to include youth with physical disabilities under the age of 30, the topic of sexuality, and quotes from youth themselves or those who cared for them. We did an inductive reflexive thematic analysis, and we found 19 peer-reviewed published studies, 10 gray literature sources from which we developed themes, five of which I'll share with you today. Our first theme is that resources do not adequately support the sexuality of youth with physical disabilities. They had unanswered questions, they wanted to have conversations, but they wanted healthcare providers or parents to start the conversations. And they wanted resources that were accurate, positive, and included diversity. Parents feared their child was sexually vulnerable. They had a lot of worries, but they often focused on the risk of sexual abuse. And many parents believed it was the job of healthcare professionals. While healthcare professionals and teachers felt unprepared, they lacked training and support, and many of them saw sexuality as an inappropriate topic to discuss with their patients or students. 
Youth often experience discrimination related to their sexuality, and many really express not feeling seen as sexually desirable and capable by society. So a young woman with cerebral palsy says, if you're disabled, then you're naturally discouraged from having sex. And our final theme was that sexual agency of youth with physical disabilities is often unrecognized. Informed consent wasn't always obtained. And so a young man with a mobility impairment shares, whether you want it or not, they touch you and you don't have control of your body. But despite these barriers, many youth still shared sexual and romantic desires and hopes for the future. So we recommend you should be engaged when creating sexuality resources, and these resources should be disability specific, sex positive, and represent diversity. And we encourage caring adults, like many of you in this virtual room, to work together to start conversations on sexuality. And here's a sneak peek of the Disability and Sexuality Resource Hub by the Profile Lab. So check it out. Thanks. Thank you, Madison. If any questions for Madison, uh, you can uh, field those at the poster session coming up. Our next presenter is Maya Murbaghiri. The title of Maya's presentation is Psyche, See-Through Gaze Optimized Text Entry in Augmented Reality Head-Mounted Display as an Alternative and Augmentive Communication System. Maya, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my presentation is about Psyche, which is a see-through gaze optimized text entry in augmented reality environment. It is an alternative communication system. Uh, the motivation is that eye gaze based interaction technology is an alternative form of communication for people with severe language or physical disabilities. Text entry is an important and frequent task in eye gaze based AAC devices. To select a key on an on a screen keyboard, you should focus on it for a dual time. This study aims to answer eye fatigue as one of the open challenges for efficient and usable text entry. It occurs mainly due to high rate of saccades between key targets and low rate of text entry. We present Psyche here, a circular keyboard designed in HoloLens 2 in augmented reality environment with ideal selection mechanism to reduce text entry rate. This is being done by bringing frequent user keys near gaze center and then adding features such as word prediction and phrase suggestion to it. The objective is that will a combination of a context relevant word prediction a phrase suggestion integrated in the design keyword will increase net text into a rate or not? An example scenario that complements gaze typing mechanisms is that, for example, edge is selected and how is appeared as current typing word prediction simultaneously to day A is appeared as next word prediction if how is selected. And again, simultaneously phrase suggestions such as how long should I and two other phrases will appear. This is a demo. Uh, this is the view in front of the user while wearing an augmented reality headset. And the participant is trying to type a question by looking at target keys for a specific period of time. Here, the center of the keyboard is stuck to the center of the eye gaze. So by moving the head, uh, keyboard is still in front of it. And when gaze open a letter for like 100 milliseconds, it is replayed with the most probable word. And then by dueling an additional 500 milliseconds, the predicted word will be selected. The number of typed word per minute in the design keyboard is around 36, which is comparable with the design, the previously designed keyboard, which was at most uh, 17. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maha, Maya, for that insightful presentation. I'm learning a lot in these quick hits. Uh, as a family leader, it's really neat for me to see from this perspective all of the exciting research that's going on at Holland Bloorview. And these quick hits are, are uh, great information snippets. 
Now, uh, everyone will have a chance to ask our uh, panelists, or I should say our quick hit presenters questions at our poster hall that's coming up at 1130. And we're just going to check here if we're going to do the Kahoot quiz next, or we might save them for the end uh, just to adjust the order of questions. All right, just got the prompt from our room. We're going to hold our Kahoot questions to the end, as well as have you all vote on your people's choice for best presentation. So we're going to move now to uh, give a warm welcome to Jennifer Ryan, our third Quick Hits presenter this morning. Her presentation is titled The Feasibility of Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation as an Adjunct to Inpatient Physiotherapy for Children and Youth with Acquired Brain Injury. All right, over to you, Jennifer. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Ryan, and our study evaluated the feasibility of transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS, as an adjunct to inpatient physiotherapy for children with acquired brain injury. In the early stages of recovery, children with ABI benefit from physiotherapy to relearn the motor skills affected by their injury. However, despite making substantial improvements, they also contend with long-term mobility challenges. TDCS may offer a solution. When paired with physiotherapy, TDCS has, an, has demonstrated improved motor outcomes in children with cerebral palsy. However, this combination has not been evaluated in pediatric ABI and led to our feasibility study that integrated TDCS into an existing inpatient ABI physiotherapy program. All admissions to the inpatient brain injury rehabilitation team at Holland Bloorview were screened for eligibility in collaboration with their clinical team. Children who enrolled in the study were randomized to receive either sham or active and nodal TDCS immediately prior to their existing inpatient physiotherapy sessions for up to 16 sessions with standardized gross motor assessment before and after intervention. Over a 21 month period, only six of 232 admissions were eligible. And while the reasons for exclusion were not unexpected, the frequency of these exclusions were unanticipated based on our team's past research experience in this program. Of the six children who were eligible, four participants were recruited. However, one participant could not commence the study due to COVID-19 research restrictions. Only one participant was able to complete the entire study protocol, and two had to be withdrawn due to unrelated changes in medical stability. TDCS was well tolerated, with all TDCS sessions that were started lasting the entire 20-minute duration. Tracking participant symptoms before and after each TDCS session allowed us to differentiate between TDCS side effects and ABI-specific symptoms. In summary, our results suggest that an outpatient TDCS protocol may be more feasible as children should be more medically stable once they've been discharged from inpatient rehab. Given the success of our TDCS symptom tracking, we recommend that future TDCS protocols for children with ABI use our methods for evaluating TDCS tolerance. We would like to thank the study participants the physicians and physiotherapists on the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Team, and the Holland Bloorview Center for Leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful presentation. And we will now welcome our fourth Quick Hits presenter. We only have five, so we're at four or five right now. And our next presenter is Kelvin Ong. His research presentation is titled, Evaluating the Reliability of a Shape Capturing Process for transradial residual limb using a non-contact scanner. Calvin, over to you. Hi, I'm Calvin, and today I'm here to talk a little bit about 3D scanning in prosthetics. Shape capturing in prosthetic socket making means to capture the geometry of the residual limb and create a model. And traditionally, prosthetists will use plaster bandages to wrap around the residual limb and then create a physical model with plaster. Another way is to use an optical scanner to create a 3D model of the residual limb. The previous studies have been testing 3D scanners on lower limbs. However, no studies have ever been conducted on upper limbs. 
and then inherent size and volume differences between the two could impact the performance of the scanner. Also, it is known that a standardized positioning method for the residualium is critical in shape capturing, but then there are also no established clinical protocol for residual upper limb, including transradio. So therefore, the objective of this study is to develop a shape capturing process for direct scanning of transradio residual limbs and then assess its reliability in volumetric and shape measurements. The main aspect of the shape capture setup is shown here. And the main goal of the setup are to prioritize client comfort and to improve the performance of the scanner for a more efficient process and better image quality. And here is the shape capture process procedures in which we have included details such as which key anatomical landmarks should be labeled, client's positioning, and also the scanning pathway for the scanner. And to evaluate the reliability of the shape capturing process, intra and inter-rater reliability of the volumetric and shape measurements were assessed, and inter-class correlation coefficients were calculated. And the threshold of ICC greater than 0 0.9 was selected for the level of reliability. And in total, 15 participants were recruited. And overall, the scanning process demonstrated excellent reliability in volumetric and shape measurements. So there are two commonly listed concerns with scanning limbs directly. One is the difficulty of scanning smaller residual limbs. And two is the patient movement or shifting of the limb during scanning, which could result in distortions of the images and also failure of the scan. But in this study, our results suggested that the developed scanning protocol can be used to capture small residual limb without compromising the reliability of the measurements. And then this study also demonstrated that the inadvert movement of the limb can be controlled through proper positioning and supporting of the clients. And perhaps the most significant contribution to this work is that it allowed us to create evidence and build the foundation for implementing digital technology in prosthetic care. Because the ultimate goal for us is to utilize technology to improve client care and the quality of prosthetic devices. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Calvin. And now we are uh, going to hear from our fifth and final presenter. Let's welcome Revi Bonder. Revy's research presentation is entitled Exploring the Extent and Nature of Disordered Eating in Adolescents and Young Adults with Spina Bifida and hydro, um, hydro, Hydrocephalus, an Interim Analysis. All right, let's hear from Revy. Hi, everyone. My name is Revy Bonder, and I am a research coordinator in the Profile Lab. Today, I will be presenting an interim analysis of our study on the extent and nature of disordered eating in adolescents and young adults with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So due to a complex interaction of factors, adolescents and young adults with spina bifida and or hydrocephalus have shown to be at a higher risk for both restrictive eating and overeating. We know that conversations about weight, mobility, and bladder slash bowel functioning occur in clinics. However, we do not know whether eating patterns, dietary manipulation, and disordered eating behaviors are being identified. And we also do not know the eating patterns and behaviors of young adults with spina bifida or how they perceive their body image. So because of this, we wanted to explore the nature, extent, type and frequency of disordered eating behaviors amongst people with SBH. And we also wanted to understand their perception surrounding their body image. And this is a first study to look at this in a Canadian population. So our study comprises a self-report cross-sectional online survey of young people aged 12 to 26 with SBH and it asks about disordered eating and eating disorder symptoms and behaviors and their relation to SBH. And it also includes validated measures of eating behaviors and body esteem. While recruitment is ongoing, 16 young people have participated to date from across Canada. 
The majority of participants reported that having conversations around their weight with healthcare providers caused them to decrease their food intake, and reasons attributed to decreased food intake included attempting to improve bowel or bladder function, transfer-related reasons, and low self-esteem. When compared to a sample of young people without disabilities, participants had greater eating, shape, and weight concerns. And when compared to a sample of children without disabilities attending a pediatric weight loss program, our sample were more likely to engage in emotional eating. The majority of participants also felt that having SBH affected the way they viewed their body. Uh, young people reported feeling self-conscious and insecure about their body and that their bodies did not fit within the able-bodied beauty standard. So overall, this interim analysis has shown us that disordered eating and eating disorders are potentially a prominent issue in young people with SBH, and they should be safely addressed in clinical settings, meaning that training for this will likely be needed. Recruitment for the study is still ongoing, and you can learn more about it by visiting our poster. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Revi, and thank you to all of our presenters. And now we're going to do and spend a couple minutes on our Cahoots game for the presentations that we just saw. Uh, so as a reminder, you're going to be using Kahoot.it, and we're going to be using the same pin we were using earlier. So we'll try this again. Oh, sorry, it's a different pin. So this is 1023136. The game pin is 1023136. Feel free to put that into the game ID and get your name on the screen here before we get started. Excellent. I see our numbers climbing there. Just a couple more uh, moments for everyone to register. And we'll have about 30 seconds per question. So we'll have time to go through each of the questions today. Looking good. Okay. As our registration climb here for the Kahoot game, we'll get started with our first question. Here we go. All right, our first question. Youth with physical disabilities want sexual resources that are, following four answers on your screen, specific to their disability, sex positive, created by youth with disabilities, or all of the above. Excellent, 10 seconds to go. All right, the correct answer was all of the above. Let's see if we know who our winner is. Oh, in the lead on the leaderboard is Jay. Jay, congratulations, but you're tied for first with user AP, excellent. Okay, we'll go to our next uh, question here. Get your phones or your devices ready. What is the environment or device used to design the interface, including the circular keyboard, Psyche, in desktop eye tracker, augmented reality, smart glass, or electroencephalography. We've got about 10 seconds left to get your answers in. All right, our answer was augmented reality. 23 folks got it right. Let's see who our leaderboard uh, top leads are. Ooh, a switch up here. Alexander in the lead, followed by Jay, but very close for the rest of the leaderboard here. So it's anyone's game. All right, let's go to our next question. Which of the following was not a barrier to TDCS into an existing inpatient brain injury physiotherapy program. Answers are on the screen there. Participants tolerance of transcranial direct current stimulation, retention of study participants, or eligibility of program admissions.
There we go. Sorry about that. My screen froze for a second. 21 folks got the answer right. Let's look at our leaderboard. Ooh, another switch up to our leaderboard. GPN in the lead, followed by Nick, followed by C, followed by KFA, and then AJ. So really, it's anyone's game. And we'll try the next question. Where is transradial limb absence? About 15 seconds left. All right, let's take a look. The correct answer was below the elbow. Let's see what our leaderboard is looking like. Oh, GPN is maintaining the lead, followed by C, A, J, K, M, A, J, L. This is a tough round. Three players lost their answer streak. All right, let's go to our next question and see who our winner is. Which of the following is not true regarding how patients view their bodies with regard to their spina bifida? We have 10 seconds left. Excellent. All right. Majority got that one right. Let's see how our leaderboard has changed up. Oh, the podium. KM. Excellent. In third place. In second place, AJ. And in first place. All right. GPN. Congratulations to our first, second, thirds and our runner ups there on the screen. Uh, congrats to everybody and thank you for participating as well as thank you to our quick hit presenters today. You know, I really think that we learned a lot in, in that quick hit format and I look forward to asking our presenters more uh, questions about their details uh, of their studies, uh, which we can do during the poster sessions that start at 1130 today. Now keep an eye out for a message from Feedloop on how you can vote for your favorite quick hit presenter. The winner will be announced during the awards portion later this afternoon.